passage. And Jemima, would you be happy to come up and read for us? We're reading from Matthew chapter 12, uh, starting with verse 22, and words will be up on the screen. I read. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this, fe this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do you people drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander will, can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words will be, you will be condemned. That was me. Sorry. Thank you, Jemima. Let's pray very briefly. Lord, thank you for your word. Um, thank you for minds to ponder what it means. Thank you for your spirit who teaches us through it. Lord, we ask for your spirit's help as we work our way through this this morning. Uh, be with me as I speak and everyone as they listen, and um, may we be encouraged, challenged, and transformed by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So we saw last week that Jesus has been healing lots of people with health issues. But then in verse 22, the story pivots a little bit. We move from Jesus healing the sick to healing someone who was possessed by a demon. Now, I don't want to get lost in the tall grass here. There's plenty we can say and even more that we can speculate if we're not careful about demon possession. If you're not from a religious background, this might seem more like a topic for a horror movie than a church service. You might be wondering, what on earth do we, as 21st century people, make of this? I think our best aim here is to see that Matthew mentions this possession, like several others in his gospel, in a fairly dispassionate and matter-of-fact way. That doesn't mean it's not serious, but it does indicate that it's also not particularly unusual in his experience. Furthermore, note that nobody in the story is disagreeing that a demon is to blame for this man's illness. On that, at least, everybody is on the same page. Those of you with particularly good memories might have noted that we actually had a very similar story to this one a few chapters back. If you flip back to Matthew chapter 9, or watch the screen here, in verses 32 to 34, we have a very similar account. A demon-possessed man who could not talk was brought to Jesus, who healed him. Matthew tells us that the crowd was amazed, or at least most of the crowd was amazed. Look at verse 34. 
The Pharisees said, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. So you might ask at this stage, what's different here? I make at least three differences. First, the extent of the the possession. In today's passage, the possessed man is both blind and mute, not just mute. We've also got the crowd's reaction. In today's uh, passage, the crowd are astonished, whereas they were just amazed before. Now, you might say, astonished, amazed. What's the difference? They're they're impressed, right? No. uh, The word that Matthew uses uh, in chapter 12 is unmistakably stronger in the original language. People were taken completely aback by what Jesus has done here. There's no sort of stronger word for being astonished. And then finally, the accusation from the Pharisees is stronger. In chapter 9, they compare Jesus to the prince of demons, but here they go a step further. In addition to comparing him with the prince of demons, they connect him with Beelzebul. Right. Who's Beelzebul? Well, translated directly, it means either the Lord of the Flies, Q literature studies in high school, or Lord of the Filth. Um, anyway, th- what more here is significant is that it was a shorthand that was used in the ancient world for Satan without having to actually say Satan. It's a bit like he who must not be named or the orange former president. It's shorthand for someone infamous, and it's something that everybody within the culture would have innately understood, right? What's going on with these Pharisees? Why are they making this accusation? Why now? Well, we saw a few weeks ago in the section that Ed preached on that after Jesus' teaching, the Pharisees had resolved that they were going to plot together and to find a way to kill Jesus. This morning's passage is actually their first attempt at putting this plan into motion. What's wrapped up in this accusation then? Why connect Jesus' miracles to Satan? This is something they'd previously hinted at in chapter 9, but here they're making the connection explicit, unmistakable. Notice that the Pharisees aren't trying to deny that something profoundly spiritual is going on here. They aren't going to try and suggest to this astonished crowd that it's all an act. They're too smart for that. Instead, they're trying to explicitly connect Jesus' healing and exercising power to Satan. Now, why would they do this? The first point is pretty straightforward. It hits at the surface level. They're trying to undermine Jesus' credibility and to cast doubts in at least some of the crowd's minds. But I think there's something deeper going on here as well. If Jesus was doing these miracles by Satan's power, he would have been deemed a sorcerer in the eyes of Jewish law and tradition. And we can see this in Jewish writings of the day. One of these, the Mishnah Sanhedrin, it's called, says this passage, the warlock, or sorcerer, is also liable to be executed by stoning. One who performs a real act of sorcery is liable, but not one who deceives the eyes, making it appear as though he is performing sorcery, as that is not considered sorcery. The one who performs a real act of sorcery is liable, and the one who deceives the eyes is exempt. I think the Pharisees are trying to back Jesus into a corner. If Jesus is doing parlor tricks or planting actors in his audience to pretend to be demon-possessed, then he's a fake, and there's no penalty under Jewish law for pretending to perform miracles. But if, however, they can succeed in persuading the crowd that Jesus is indeed performing these supernatural acts in alliance with Satan, then they can petition to have him stoned, to have him executed. But before the Pharisees can follow up on their plan, Jesus issues a series of brilliant arguments in response. Notice the little clause in verse 25. Jesus knew their thoughts. He knows what they're up to. It's like playing chess with someone who knows what move you're going to make ahead of time, right? Let's see what Jesus says. First, if a kingdom or city is divided against itself, it cannot stand. He's beginning with what might be the most obvious critique against the Pharisees' charge. The young people in the crowd could probably figure this one out. Now, this phrase from history has been used by lots of different people, uh, 
most famously perhaps by then Senate candidate Abraham Lincoln, who was running for a Senate seat in Illinois in 1858 as the United States was beginning to fracture under the weight of a looming civil war. Just this idea of a kingdom divided, a nation divided, a city divided, even a household divided. Finish the idea. If a kingdom or city is divided against itself, it cannot stand. Therefore, if Satan drives himself out, he's fighting against his own kingdom. The image is clear enough. Satan has rendered this poor man both mute and blind, unable to see and unable to speak. Satan has removed this man's agency to communicate with others, and Jesus, in one fell swoop, gives it back to him. Satan, according to Jesus, wouldn't do this because it would be to undermine himself. But Jesus takes it a step further. He leans into their argument and he goes deeper. Look what he says in verse 27. If I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. And here comes Jesus' second point. If Jesus drives out demons by Beelzebul, how do the Pharisees exorcists drive out demons? He's on the offensive now, isn't he? You see, Jewish figures performing exorcisms became a growing movement in the centuries between the close of the Old Testament, the older part of the Bible, and the time of Jesus. But what's interesting is that most of their practice seems to be grounded in the superstitions, the superstitious practices of the surrounding nations. But what's interesting to note Jesus doesn't apparently deny the effectiveness of Jewish exorcisms. Do you notice this? We probably shouldn't make too much of it because the main point seems to be suggesting that no effective exorcisms come from Satan. Rather, the Holy Spirit is the only means by which people can be freed in this way. Tom Wright has a helpful little paragraph here. He says, there are other... Jewish exorcists whose work meets with some success at least, are they in league with the devil as well? Of course not. Rather, Jesus' work is a sign of something, oh, sorry, lost myself here. Jesus' work is a sign of something that his contemporaries were longing for deeply but could not expect to look like this. God's kingdom was coming upon them, bursting in as a force, a power to be reckoned with, coming as the only true answer to the question, how is Jesus doing it? So how is Jesus doing it? He tells us in verse 28 in the form of a hypothetical statement. If it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. A few observations here. First, notice that this passage contains more references to the Holy Spirit than any other part of Matthew's Gospel. Jesus hasn't made the broad and wide declarations that he is the son of God and savior of the world yet. But in identifying his miraculous works with the spirit of God and by teaching with an air of authority that no other rabbi would have done, Jesus is beginning to pull back the curtain and give his group of followers a deeper look into his nature and mission. This is very much a continuation of what we saw last time in Matthew 12:18 with the quote from the prophet Isaiah that says, Jesus is the chosen servant in whom God delights. Then notice what it says. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. Now, second, we need to look at in this in light of the verses that follow. The images of the strong man's house as well as the gathering and scattering. Did you find the strong man section a bit odd? Is Jesus advocating burglary? What's going on here? No, the consensus among interpreters of the Old Testament is that the strong man Jesus is referring to is Satan. A key part to Jesus establishing his kingdom on earth is that Satan would be bound, that he would be limited in some way. Not taken up, but limited in some way. And according to the American theologian Stanley Hauerwas, this binding may well have happened back when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness at the start of his earthly ministry. As Adam and Eve were tempted in the Garden of Eden and failed, Jesus too was tempted by Satan, but he triumphed against Satan's temptations. Hauerwas writes, this is a brilliant quote, he says, Jesus faced Satan in the wilderness and was subjected to the worst that Satan could do and yet he prevailed. 
He has, as Isaiah 49, 24 to 25 says he would do, taken the mighty captive by refusing Satan's terms of battle. Satan's house not only can be, but has been plundered through the work of the Holy Spirit. So what is Jesus getting at in his teaching so far? It's that these signs and wonders he's performing aren't the main event. There's signs pointing toward the main event, which is the kingdom coming to earth. I'm going to say that again. These signs and wonders that Jesus is performing aren't the main event. They're signs pointing to the main event, which is the kingdom coming to earth. Note the change of language here. Before in the gospel, we had language like the kingdom was at hand or the kingdom was drawing near. But now the kingdom was upon you. The Pharisees were expecting a physical reign and a physical enemy to conquer. They were expecting the Messiah to ride in on a horse and with God's help kick the Romans out of Jerusalem, reestablishing the kingdom of Israel. But they completely missed what Jesus was saying. He meant the arrival of a spiritual kingdom. And the victory over the enemy? It's a spiritual victory over Satan. And this all serves to undermine the Pharisees even more. Who would, ex- who would we expect to be the first ones to recognize what God was doing in the world? I think many of us would naturally assume religious leaders, people who were trained in God's word, people who had been longing for and anticipating God's saving action in history. In short, the Pharisees of all people should have recognized the works of God happening before their eyes, but they don't. What's more, they've dug themselves in even deeper. In trying to back Jesus into a corner and pin him as a sorcerer who achieves his miracles by the power of Satan himself, they are literally saying that the work of the Holy Spirit is actually the work of Satan. We see Jesus doubling down on his language in verse 30. He says, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. He's saying in unmistakable terms, that the Pharisees are pitting themselves against Jesus, against the Holy Spirit, and against the kingdom of God. Jesus is accusing them of acting in outright opposition to everything they should be standing for. And note the implication. Jesus is literally saying that if you're not with him, you're against him. It's a stark warning, perhaps one that not enough people pay attention to today. Jesus' ministry has gathered people who were able to plainly recognize God at work. But the Pharisees were trying not only to undermine Jesus himself, but to cast doubt among his followers, to scatter them. And this leads us to Jesus' biggest charge against them, that they've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. If you're not coming today from a church background, you might have found Jesus' statements on blaspheming the Holy Spirit a bit odd. Hey, if you are coming from a church background, you've probably found the language a bit odd and might be curious as to what I'm about to say in the time that we've got left. I want to say a brief preamble. While we're coming to tricky texts in the Bible, there can be a tendency to forget everything else the Bible says about a topic and get ourselves tangled up. I want to avoid that. But there can also be a tendency to downplay verses like this because they don't seem to fit within a wider theology that we like. And therefore, we just try to brush it off and find an easy way of solving, well, it just means this, tick. I want to avoid that as well. Notice Jesus' language here. Every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. He goes further. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. You might have some questions. I've got some too. What is it that makes this particular sin so unforgivable? Why on earth can we be forgiven for everything, literally up to nailing the Son of God to a cross? And yet these Pharisees are rebuked so harshly, so definitively. I want to start by saying what I think the passage doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that there are some sins we can accidentally stumble into and inadvertently damn ourselves for all eternity. 
If you're sitting in this room and you're worried that there's something you've done or thought that would keep you from being forgiven by Jesus, I want to assure you I don't think that's the case. Second, if you're a Christian and wrestling with whether a sin you've committed since coming to Christ might cause you to lose your salvation, I want to assure you I don't think that's the case. Remember, we need to consider this passage in light of what we know from the whole Bible about the nature of God's love and God's forgiveness. So what does it mean then? First, we need to look at who the Pharisees were blaspheming against in our passage. I said earlier that they thought they were taking shots at Jesus, but in saying that Jesus is working by the power of Satan, they were actually attributing to Satan the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. Second, we need to look at who the, what the Pharisees should have believed about the Holy Spirit. At this stage in history, it's worth remembering that God's people didn't have the robust framework of the Trinity, that's God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we have now. But I found the commentator William Barclay helpful here. He wrote that the Jewish understanding of the Holy Spirit was essentially that one, the Spirit brings truth to men and women from God, and two, that the Spirit enables men and women to recognize and understand that truth when they saw it. So the Spirit brings God's truth to men and women and enables men and women to recognize and understand that truth when they saw it. This is the kind of thing that would have been known to all Jews, not just the sort of elite Pharisees. So that's what they should have believed. Third, we need to consider this in light of what Jesus had just been doing. What did Jesus just do? I don't think that it's a coincidence here that he's just liberated someone from a demon that had made him both blind and mute. The man physically couldn't see and wasn't able to speak. Alongside this, we have Jesus heavily implying that the Pharisees, in their stubborn legalism, are not only spiritually blind to the work of God's Spirit in front of them, but they're unable to declare that their long-awaited Messiah is Lord when they see him and meet him in the flesh. They can't see the truth. They can't speak the truth. So if they're not just rejecting the spirit of God's work before their eyes, but calling it the work of Satan, they're actively trying to undermine the coming of the kingdom of God. And this is where I th finally think we can understand what their why their actions are unforgivable. It's not that they're doing something that can't be forgiven. It's that they're rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit through Jesus. And in doing so, they're rejecting the only means by which they could be forgiven. Say that again. It's not that they're doing something that can't be forgiven. It's that in rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit through Jesus, they're rejecting the only means by which they could be forgiven. Tom Wright puts it this way. I think it's helpful. He says, Jesus is warning against looking at the work of the Spirit and declaring that it must be the devil's doing. If you do that, it's not just that you won't be forgiven. You can't be because you have just cut off the very channel along which forgiveness would come. Once you declare that the only remaining bottle of water is poison, you condemn yourself to dying of thirst. How do we apply this? Let's look at how Jesus finishes up his teaching. Jesus says, I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words, you will be acquitted, and by your words, you will be condemned. This is the culmination of the section. Jesus is underscoring that words matter. But they matter particularly because they represent what's in someone's heart. The Pharisees weren't just religious legalists. They had hatred and evil stored up within their hearts, and this surfaced in their accusations against Jesus. But Jesus is expanding his point beyond the Pharisees, beyond space and time. He says that everyone will have to give an account for what they've spoken. That's you and that's me. At the heart of the Christian gospel is the premise that there's nothing we can say in our defense that will exonerate us before God. There's no argument that would be good enough. Our only defense is to acknowledge that we know we're sinners and that we believe that Jesus is Lord. According to Jesus, our words condemn us. Lies, half-truths, gossip, hurtful insults, slander. 
They all serve to condemn us. And what's more, they're just an outward indication of our inward sinfulness. But don't miss what Jesus says. By your words, you will be acquitted. If you're wrestling with the weight of your sin, if you're suffering from the effects of your sin, if you're anxious about the consequences of your sin, there's hope. Do you want to follow Jesus? It's not about coming to church. It's not about signing up for a dozen rotas or anything like that. It's, it's two things. Repent and believe. Confess your sin before God and believe that through Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection, you've been forgiven. Have you repented? Have you believed? We're going to take a little pause and then reflect through singing a song of response. And it's a song that tells us a story of becoming aware of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. If that's true for you, sing it out and proclaim the wonder of that story. And if it's not true for you just yet, I want you to pay attention to the words and ask yourself whether you're hearing Jesus' voice. And if you are hearing Jesus' voice, I would encourage you, don't harden your heart. So the musicians want to come up. We stand together. was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and light, that led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own the rebel to your will, and if you had is my 
interact with each other at Hope City. So why not turn to someone sitting near you and just take a minute, share your reflections on this morning's talk or discuss one of the questions. I'll get the team to pop the Slido questions up for us on screen just now. You can still ask questions as well. There's some crackers in there. I'm looking forward to hearing Tom's response. Do think yourselves though, before you hear what Tom thinks, get your own brain on it. Think, what would I say if someone asked me that? And feel free to pop more questions in vote up the ones you want. I'll give you a couple of minutes and then we'll come back and hear Tom's responses to some of them. But get your own brain on it first. I can still hear a good bubble of chat in the room, but in the interest of time and our kids who are in the kids' programmes, let's have a little look at our, our top voted questions. So, Tom, mm -hmm. does this mean that Christians will have to stand before God and give an account of their work spoken? Do we all have to do this? Short answer, I think yes. Um, but let me explain that a little bit. I think that there is a misconception sometimes when we talk about the gospel. I don't know if anyone's been to Disney World. You can go to Disney World and wait in queues forever. Or you can spend a little bit of extra money and get the bypass the queue, go straight on the ride, and go have fun and you know go on tw twice the things during your time there. And I think some people kind of imagine salvation as kind of a fast pass straight into eternity. But... I think that if we consider the Bible as a whole, the image seems to be that we're all resurrected together and we all stand before God. Um, but here's where the difference is. Um, without Christ, anything we would try to say in our defense is pointless. Um, but like the song said, at the end of the day, for the Christian to stand up, all they can say is, my only boast is you. I have nothing to stand on other than what Jesus has done for me and what Jesus has done in me. And so, yeah, I think that that is the ultimate trajectory for everybody. Um, the difference is only uh, whether or not you have Jesus as your advocate. Thank you, Tom, that's a really helpful explanation. And if you're here today and you think, I, I, I don't have that, I'm not sure when I have to give an account that I will be able to say, Jesus is my only boast, come and talk to us. If you're yeah. not sure that's true for you, Talk to Tom, talk to me, talk to Matt, talk to anyone who's got a lanyard on or looks <laughs> vaguely friendly. 
find someone. Please don't leave here thinking, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's true for me. We want to have that confidence. Thank you, Tom. We're going to take one more. Um, this is more about the Pharisees. Mm. If the Holy Spirit gives eyes to understand who Jesus is, why doesn't he let the Pharisees see who Jesus is? Mm. Are they really accountable for their own actions? I think they are, and this is the really tricky implication of this passage and lots of other passages in the Bible. Um, I do think it's worth noting that some Pharisees do see these things. And it's interesting, the image. So Saul, the Pharisee who persecutes the followers of Jesus, is on his way to go persecute followers of Jesus. And what happens? He's struck blind. And then it's only through this vision of Christ, which I think, according to our passage today would suggest that the Holy Spirit brings upon him, that the scales fall from his eyes and he's able to see Jesus, whose people and who himself he'd been persecuting. Um, so yeah, you can be, uh, and many Pharisees, I think, certainly fit this mold. You can see people coming to faith in Jesus and the Holy Spirit opening their eyes. The Holy Spirit, we also have to wrestle with, doesn't seem to open everybody's eyes in these ways. Now, that can lead us to say, well, okay, if it's not up to me, I'm going to put my feet up. God will sort everything out. No, I don't think that's what the people in the Bible were doing. But it also means that it's not on you personally. It's not on the killer argument, the killer persuasion, these kind of things. But actually, um, it's the Spirit working through God's Word. Um, works in particular time in particular places. You might be laying a foundation that someone builds on 20 years from now. Or you might be picking up what somebody's grandmother told them when they were young and they've only kind of now clicked. Um, so don't see it as a sign of despair, but actually just see it as we are part of the work of the Spirit. Awesome, thank you, Tom. Do, do you not find that when someone gives a response to one question, they're like, three more questions pop up? So if you want to scratch at that more, <laughs> Tom, are you available yeah. if people want yeah, to Yeah, I'm around. Yep. Brilliant. Tom's around. Tom's really good at thinking through questions. So come and talk to him. <laughs> right, Tom, before you escape, could you just close our queue and our time? Just remind us, what's the... Can I get my iPad? Yeah, and I you will. can get your iPad. He's written down what the big idea <laughs> I is. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. Brilliant. But then he left his iPad <laughs> but over But then there. I left it. Right. We're Hope City. We wing it. What's the big idea, Tom? Do, what do you want us to take home? Jesus' kingdom is a spiritual one, and he's defeating a spiritual enemy. And are we going to be with him, or are we going to be against him? Closing out with a question. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.